All right, looks like uh, I see the red dot. We're officially recording now, so we'll give it a few seconds. Steve, are you? did you make it back? I did. I had one cheese stick, so I'm good to go. Perfect, perfect. <laughs> Don't want you got to present with a, a full stomach, so. Now let's get it up to 50 people here, and then we'll go ahead and introduce Steve. And uh, uh, the idea of today's presentation was really trying to uh, let people walk away with uh, um, skill. Um, and rather, so this is going to be more of a uh, real-time presentation. Um, Steve's going to... I talked about the uh, um, creating and using custom soils databases, uh, you know, the USDA, the SUGRO, um, the gridded soil survey. So um, it can become pretty popular, and uh, a lot of people are using it these days for all different types of uh, applications from, you know, oil and gas and pipelines and uh, culture resources. And, and so a lot of the toolboxes are just uh, custom scripts that Steve has uh, written and uh, been a part of uh, providing to the public. So uh, Steve is a GIS analyst for the USDA Natural Resources Conservation Service, uh, NRCS. Uh, he's been doing it about a total of 23 years uh, in the state of Kansas and Nebraska. Um, and so uh, he's five years of Kansas State office in Salina, two years in the state Jet was a GIS specialist in Nebraska. Uh, spent some time in Lincoln, Nebraska. So um, he's got a, a very uh, solid background in GIS. So we're going to go ahead and uh, let Steve take it away here. So we're about four. Well, we're officially five minutes afternoon. So Steve, I'm going to go ahead. And, uh, so this is uh, Steve Peasley uh, from the uh, USDA, and uh, I'm going to go ahead and mute everybody and just let you do your presentation. Everybody's encouraged to uh, make comments and questions in the chat window. Thank you. All right, great. Thank you, Brian. Well, it's a pleasure to be with you folks uh, this afternoon. Uh, hopefully technology will work for me. Um, I usually don't try to do live demos on these things, but um, we'll keep our fingers crossed and, and uh, see how it goes. <clears throat> so I do have a, a few slides to show just Brief introduction, talking a little bit about what we're what we're going to learn. The rest of it, primarily, like Brian said, going to be live demo. And so, what we're going to talk about primarily is where to obtain soils data, um, which would be web soil survey, and how to assemble that soils data from the traditional Sergo product, which is uh, shape files and an access database into the GSERGO database, which is a file geo database that doesn't have the size limitations that shape files and access databases do. And then we'll talk about um, how to create soil map layers from fairly complex data set and how to uh, prep it for any sort of a project. And so the data layers that we're going to uh, need for this um, demo are, first of all, our soil survey status map shape file, which you can obtain from Web Soil Survey. And then we're going to need a local copy of all the Sergo downloads from Web Soil Survey uh, that cover our area of interest. And the other option would be to um, just download the pre-existing statewide tiles of GSERGO that we have on the geospatial data gateway down at, at Fort Worth. And the software that we're going to use today uh, is primarily going to be um, ArcGIS Desktop, um, which is what the, the tools are developed in. And of course, we're kind of limited to that since we're using the file geo database format from Esri. Um, the tools toolbox is not compatible with uh, ArcGIS Pro yet. Um, we still got a little bit more development to do with the desktop version, so I think we're going to stick with that for just a little while longer. Um, then we're also going to work with uh, the Soil Data Development Toolbox, which is a single ARC toolbox, and then the documentation, which is 
both of those are available from the GSERGO homepage. And probably the easiest way to find that is just to Google uh, GSERGO and NRCS. And that should one of the, probably one of the first links will be to our GSERGO homepage. Um, then we'll also obtain the Sergo downloads and then that shape file. And then, oops, didn't mean to do that. Um, so we have, I have a list of the URLs for all the data and tools and documentation. And um, I don't know what the best way to get you this this slide would be, uh, but we can talk about that maybe at the end of the presentation. Uh, so the first first link there is just to our, the soils, NRCS soils webpage. We're not actually going to go there. Um, but Sergo downloads are actually available off the web soil survey. And so this is a web soil survey. I assume that quite a few of you are probably familiar with that. Um, we're not going to directly download the data, the Sergo data from web soil survey. We, ha we have an automated tool that, that does that for you. But one thing you will need before you get started is on the from the soil survey status page or link is a shape file. And basically it's just an uh, a polygon shape file that has an index to all of our soil survey areas. And so that having that shape file is handy to know um, which data sets you actually need to download. And it where it's designed to work with uh, with our toolbox. Um, this is the G Sergo homepage. And you can see most of our URLs, unfortunately, are rather cryptic. So I, I find the easiest way is to start with a known link or just to Google to find this page. Um, but there's a lot of documentation. You can't actually download the data here, but you can download the Arc Toolbox and the documentation for using GSERGO. Fairly comprehensive user guide, so I would definitely recommend take the time to, to read that. And then I think at this point, we are ready to go ahead and, well, I guess I should take you on down the page here. Uh, so further down the page, this is the ARC toolbox. And I do update this on a fairly regular basis. Um, I know there'll be another update coming out later this week. And I'm guessing uh, since we had a few minor data changes uh, to the next uh, Sergo refresh, There'll be another um, update coming out uh, probably in two or three weeks. So if you have problems with the tools, um, always check here first to make sure there's not a more current version available. Um, there are a couple of user guides and a quick user guide as well that are available. You can download those, take a look at them first and see if this is something that you'd be interested in. And if it is, then you can go ahead and download and and install the tools. They're all just um, Python-based Arc Toolbox. Uh, most of the tools are designed to run in Arc Maps, so nothing fancy about the installation. Just a matter of downloading and un unzipping those. And I'm going to try to switch to Arc Map if it'll cooperate. There we go. Okay, so the area we're looking at here uh, is basically North Texas. And so we've got displayed on the screen, we've got um, our soil survey boundaries. Those are the black polygon areas with the, the labels have the index value or the area symbol for each soil survey. And those are linked back directly to the shape files and Sergo data sets that we have on web soil survey. They all use that identifier. And then to actually, uh, let's see what else. And then we've also got, um, of course, the ESRI base map, USA topo maps being displayed. 
underneath. And then we have this other polygon layer uh, with the two rectangles. Um, and in the center of the screen will be um, polygon number four. And that's what we're going to use as kind of as our little project to start off with. So we're going to go through how to download the data for the area that's covered by polygon number four, um, that corridor, and how to assemble that into a G-Circle database, and then how to create soil maps for that area. Um, so the first thing I normally do is to go ahead and just um, select the polygon that I want to download data for. And then we can use um, this toolbox right here. This is the Soil Data Development Toolbox. And it has contains um, five different tool sets. So they're kind of grouped into different areas. And the first one we're going to use is just the download Sergo toolbox or tool set. So we have different ways of um, downloading the data. Um, we can either download by area symbol, which would be just basically using a query. So if we wanted to download all of Texas surveys, we'd just tell the tool to give it the wild card of, of TX, and it would go ahead and select all those surveys from Websil Survey and download them and unzip them. But we don't want to do that. Uh, today we're just going to use the download Sergo by map option. And so this is what the tool looks like. Um, you can see that there are several parameters and I do incorporate help into each of the tools. So it's a good idea if you have questions about any of the parameters, go ahead and read the help. That's what it's there for. Um, you can see that some of the parameters are required, the, the top three, the rest of them are all optional. So the first thing I do is identify which layer in, in my ArcMap table of contents is the survey boundary layer, my index layer. And so I'm selecting that and it's being slow. For some reason. So basically what it's going to do is um, use that layer to select which surveys we want to download. We're hopefully not having internet problems now. Okay. Yeah, everything evidently my internet's pretty slow today. Um, so it has listed um, all the survey areas that are available in the country, um, which I don't really want. Let me cancel out of that real quick and add one more step. So I'm going to select the survey areas that are corridor crosses. So my target layer is going to be my survey boundaries. And I'm going to use the corridor shape file and the selected features. So I only have one feature selected, one polygon corridor, and apply and close. So now you can see in the in the ArcMap display that we have uh, five soil survey areas selected. Now if I go back to the uh, back to the tool, things should run a little bit more smoothly. I just skipped a step. Okay, so it's identified which survey areas are available from Web Soil Survey. It actually sent a query to one of our online services. And I'm going to tell it where to download those files to. And I've created a folder, a uh, ERISA folder here. And then so I'm going to download all the shape files and, and ta tables to the Circle Downloads folder. And then I want to select all five surveys. So this would actually work um, at any scale. You can use it against one survey area if that's all your project covers, or you could do it for the entire country. 
which basically that's what I did earlier when I forgot to apply my selection. Um, the rest of the options uh, are not necessary for GSERGO, so at this point we're ready to go. And we'll start the download. This will take a couple of minutes, um, and I can go ahead and, and talk a little bit about the process that it's going through right now and what we'll end up with. <clears throat> so the WebSoul survey um, stores all of our Sergo data sets. Uh, there's about 3,300, I believe, available across the country. And unfortunately, those aren't in a, a cache where we can directly access a, like a shared folder or an FTP site and download. They have them uh, behind a security firewall. And so unless you know the actual um, server path and folder path and then the exact name of the zip file that these are stored in, there's no way for you to just browse through them and, and download them manually. But I have built this tool that that is able to uh, supply those names and the path and it goes ahead and, and downloads them automatically. Um, depending on your internet speed, it could take anywhere from five seconds to five minutes to download each one of these surveys. So we're gonna keep our fingers crossed and hope that it runs fairly quickly. If not, I do have a, a backup cache. <clears throat> so the other thing it's doing behind the scenes here is it's unzipping those files and renaming the contents to meet sort of a standard naming convention. Um, they changed the convention a few years ago and it doesn't match uh, what's on the WebSoul survey doesn't match the naming convention we use in our USDA field offices. So I, and that's one of the things I built this tool for was to use in the field offices. So um, it does rename them back to the old standard and if so desired, uh, if you want to use this data with uh, Soil Data Viewer, it will go ahead and uh, import them into the Access database. This has taken a little bit too much time, so I think what I'm going to do is cancel out of this and go ahead and just go to my backup cache. I'm going to cancel that for right now and switch out. It's one of the joys of uh, live demos. If I can get to it, I should have had that open first. Give me just a second, folks. Okay. Okay, the set that I downloaded earlier um, basically stored that in that same folder, uh, ERISA folder. Right here. And so basically what we're doing when we create this local cache of all these Sergo downloads, um, this is a one-time thing. You only have to do this once. So whether you're, if you decide later you want to expand the, your area of interest or your project, you want to create a larger G Sergo database, then it's simply a matter of, you know, downloading any additional files to add to your, to your local cache. And these are what the Sergo data sets look like. Um, you have a folder that includes the survey area symbol, the spatial containing the shape files, and then the tabular folder containing all of the data for the tables. So I'll cancel out of that download tool and pretend that we went through the entire process. And at this point, what we can do is go ahead and go to the next tool set 
and creates a GSERGO database itself that would include those five uh, soil survey areas. And there's a couple different tools here that we could use. Um, this is the Create GSERGO by Map tool. And it looks a little bit similar to our previous tool. Um, we're going to tell it where the Sergo downloads are at. And we're going to tell it what survey boundaries we're using. And it recognizes that those five survey areas are already selected in that layer. And then we're going to tell it um, where to create our new file geo database and give it a name. And then the only other thing we really need to tell the tool is what region of the country we're in. And it's going to set um, the output projection according to that parameter. So lower 48 states, it's going to use the USGS CONUS uh, NED83 uh, ALBERS projection. And that's all you really have to set. Uh, again, there's help for everything. and click OK, and hopefully this will run a little more quickly. So it's going to import, um, it's going to create the empty geo database first, which is very important. So it's, it has a standard XML workspace document that it's using to create this database. So it has all of the empty tables, feature classes, relationship classes, and indexes, even some initial metadata built into that. XML workspace. So that's what it's creating right now is just the empty geo database. And then it's going to go look at all of those uh, Sergo data sets. And it's going to look at those and determine the best order to import those in. So it does kind of a spatial sort, um, which isn't really that important in a five survey area database. But if you're doing this for a large region, multiple states, then it's a good idea to go ahead and um, it increases the performance and it's not skipping all over the place when it does the draws. <clears throat> so basically right now it's going through and adding, creating the soil polygon layer uh, with those four, five survey areas. It actually goes through the spatial part of the process fairly quickly. The part that actually takes more time would be the uh, the tabular import. There's about 68 tables uh, containing just attribute data that's associated with the with the polygon feature class. And so it's going to go through each of those five survey areas and import the tables from those data sets. And then it'll do some indexing and things like that to improve the performance. Um, you know, we've made some, and you know, every year we recreate these GSERGO data sets. Um, and every year we make some some minor improvements. And this year we've improved, I think, some of the indexing on some of the tables, um, particularly on some of the big tables, so that when we're creating soil maps with these databases, it uh, for those of you that have worked with the large databases in the past, I think you'll you'll see a definite improvement. And while it's running that, I think I'll take you to another spot, take a look at some data. Give me just a moment. Um, I can show you some data that I've already created and we can go look at the GSERGO database and maybe talk about a few of the things that, you know, unless you really like to dig deep, you might not know about these these special features. Okay, so let me go to my little external drive and go to some existing data. So this is a database that I created earlier. And you can see there's a listing. These are all the attribute tables. 
that are included. And then we're starting to see some feature classes. Um, this is the big polygon layer. That's the biggest, one of the biggest uh, tables in the database. Um, that was all mapped at one to 12 or one 24,000 scale. So it's fairly detailed information. Um, this is the survey boundary layer for those five survey areas. Um, so that's what that looks like. The polygon, map unit polygon layer looks like that, fairly dense. Um, the other feature classes I'm really not going to talk about. We don't need to cover those today. Um, and then below all of these Z tables are all relationship classes. So there's a lot of relationship classes. You can actually walk through from the polygon layer all the way to the, the lowest level table and see how that data is related. But you know, there's only a certain amount you can do with that in a file geo database, but it's, it's still occasionally useful things to know. Um, the other thing I might point out, some of you may not know, if we look at the metadata for that map unit polygon layer, we do take the time to populate the database or the metadata, including the, a list of the survey areas that are included in this data set and the date that those were actually kind of a the date that they were added to WebSoul survey. So if you want to ever want to know if your um, GSERGO database is out of date, you can simply look up the date in the metadata and then go to WebSoul survey and see if there's a more current version available. Um, so I don't have the raster actually built in this layer. Let me look and see if I can find database with the raster layer. Not that one either. Hmm. And not that one. Well, you may have to wait. Let me see. I'll dig up a raster layer here somewhere. Uh, well, it looks like I wiped them all off. This laptop's a little bit low on space, so. And the raster is one of the things that takes up a lot of space. Okay. So this is the actually the CONUS data set. Um, and you can see how fast that that raster layer displays. That's a 90 meter um, raster, which is still fairly detailed for a CONUS data set. But you can see how fast that displays. So it's really great for creating cartographic products or for uh, uh, doing analysis. And you know, one thing I should point out about this raster is that it is aligned to the um, NLCD raster and also to the NAS cropland raster. Um, so they're all integer rasters and they're all aligned um, to the 30 meter NAS cropland. So any of your analysis is going to align perfectly and, and should run fairly quickly. And Looks like the tabular import is almost finished. Um, it, one of the last things it does is run some indexes and then it'll add some metadata and then we can generate the raster layer for the database and then we're ready to start doing some uh, mapping and analysis. So the metadata that's adding right now is, is fairly basic. Um, it updates some of the dates in the metadata, um, but that's still something I'd like to do a little bit more with. Um, it's a little bit painful using Python to update metadata in, in ArcGIS. Um, 
So I always, I always hate doing that part, but I know there's a little bit more I could do to improve it and, and automate it just a little bit better because I know everybody hates to manually do edit metadata. So the more that I can add to the dark toolbox, then the better your metadata is going to be. Okay, so it took about nine minutes to create the five county GSERGO database. And let me get rid of our catalog. And so also in this same tool set, the GSERGO database tool set is the create GSERGO raster. Um, and so to run this tool, we just need to tell it, um, oops, wrong folder which database we want to add the raster to. And where did I put it at? And Sorry, I've got a short memory today. Hmm. Okay. I should have written that down. Okay, hang on just a second, folks. Sorry about that. Okay, so it was in EGSERGO 2017. Okay. All right, so I've actually, here's the uh, the map unit polygon layer that we just created in the new database. And then to create the, the raster for that database, when we select the database, and right now it's set to automatically um, convert that ME polygon feature class to raster. Um, there's another tool that will let you convert other um, other layers besides ME Polygon, uh, but we'll just run the standard standard raster right now. And so it automatically aligns to the NAS cropland layer. You don't have to have it on hand. It just does a calculation based on the coordinate system so that it's aligned to the NAS data. And this should run fairly quickly. You have the option of creating um, either 5, 10, 30, or 90 meter rasters with this tool. And it's designed to um, use the same coordinate system, which would be the Albers USGS. <coughs> so once it, uh, once it creates the raster, it'll go ahead and, and create the attribute table and add the MU key, which is the key that you can use to join the raster to any of the, the attribute tables. Because so at this point it's, it's uh, created the raster and it's gonna go ahead and calculate statistics and update the MU key values and then it'll add some metadata, uh, pyramids and all that good stuff. 
The one thing that people sometimes have problems with, I have the tool set so it uses uh, the Scratch Geo Database for some of the temporary output. And one thing that causes problems, if, if you have your geoprocessing uh, environment, current workspace set to the same as the default, uh, or excuse me, the Scratch Geo Database, it will throw an error. So all you need to do is create um, a Scratch Geo Database in another location. Okay, so it took about two minutes to create the raster. Uh, we can add that real quickly. You can see the, the naming convention, it always names it map unit raster underscore and then the resolution of the raster. And turn that layer off. Turn the raster layer on. That doesn't look like much right now. Um, But if I change the symbology to uh, to use the MU key value, then you can see a little bit of variation in the raster. And we've gone on about 40 minutes, so I think I'm going to speed try to speed this up just a little bit, and we will go into some of the mapping tools. And the first one we're going to look at is the Create Soil Map layer. And this is sort of like a, for those of you that have ever used Soil Data Viewer before, um, this is sort of a Soil Data Viewer analog. Um, and what it does is it allows the users to, to create soil maps with the symbology, and with all the correct table relationships built in, then it also automatically handles all of the one-to-many relationships in the data aggregation. So it'll take like the horizon level data and summarize that to the map unit level so that you can create a soil map with the data. Um, so the same as Soil Data Viewer, you have a, an SDV folder setting. And so we can run, for instance, um, under land classifications, we can run the NCCPI, uh, which stands for National Commodity Crop Productivity Index. And again, like the other tools that I showed you earlier, most of the parameters are automatically set for you, um, either that or they may be turned off if they're not applicable. Then CCPI is, is not a horizon level attribute. So some of the other options such as uh, top depth and bottom depth, those are not, those are grayed out or turned off since that's not a horizon level attribute. So if everything's showing green on here, um, we're good to go. We can go ahead and generate NCCPI map for those five counties. And generally most of these, uh, these map options run fairly quickly. And then if you're using the, uh, the ME polygon feature class, all of the symbology is automatically added for you. Uh, as you can see in this, in the top of the table of contents, so we have our NCCPI map layer and it's automatically set the symbology for you. Um, the only thing it doesn't do automatically is turn the legend right side up. Um, so you still have to do that manually. But NCCPI is an index, so it just runs from zero to, to one. And some of the other maps that we could generate real quickly would be so, somewhat comparable. Under land management, um, we could run a Texas 
a local in Texas in TERP, so we could look at fencing where post depth is uh, less than 36 inches. So be local in TERP, some of you might be interested in. And once it's finished creating each of these map layers, um, one thing I'll highlight here that is important is that each of those map layers, when it's created, those um, the symbology and all of the data links are saved in a layer file in the same folder as the GSERGO database. So once you've created a set of um, you know suite of maps using GSERGO data. You could actually package that up just with the layer files in the geo database and send somebody else. Uh, everything's relatively path, um, so it'd be fairly easy to transfer this data set to somebody else, and they can look at the data and look at the maps, so on and so forth. Um, so if I display that real quickly, you can kind of see what that looks like. Uh, the red areas are very very limited probably because of flooding. Um, some of the green areas have no limitations. And the other thing I should point out, if we go to the layer properties for fencing interpretation, um, the tool does automatically add a narrative description on the uh, general tab. So if you need metadata to add to your uh, to your maps um, that you put together, you can just easily copy and paste this this information um, into your map into a text box. The other thing I should point out at the bottom of the description or the narrative also have include all of the settings that the user had when they created this map. So it tells us. Uh, what aggregation method it used, um, the name of the geo database, uh, the feature layer used, the name of the rating table that's stored in the database, uh, location of the layer file, and then who created the the map and what actually what script was used. So a little more metadata. Um, and I say I'm running running pretty late so i don't know brian do you want me to uh um at this point start uh, taking questions or what would you yeah, need we suggest? Can go ahead, yeah we can go ahead and take some some questions here um so uh, one that i had was um let's say i was going to do you know a pipeline and going to run it across here and let's say right. I, I wanted to uh, uh do a cost estimate for a uh, um depth of bedrock let's say six feet or so i mean and so just to be able to get the cut fill and do a cost estimate well which one would we use so you go okay sure and we could go to back to the uh create saw map tool and they handle a little bit funny in sergo and gsergo data they actually have depth to uh different layers like um, in three different categories in Texas, I believe. Let me see. make sure I'm in the right spot. Nope, I'm not depth to. Okay, so under the soil qualities and features, there is a depth to any soil restriction, or you can do depth to a selected restriction. Uh, if we do any, if we select that first option, depth to any restriction, um, you could end up with um, hard pans and things like that, which you don't, probably don't care too much about when it comes to pipelines. Um, you're probably more interested in bedrock. And so you can see on the choice list here under depth to restri selected restrictive layer, you can pick uh, in this area, in these five counties, we have density, density bedrock, lithic bedrock, and paralithic bedrock. So you actually end up creating um, three separate map layers. I'll go ahead and run that first one. 
and show you what that looks like. But that could be, once you've created this layer, could actually be converted to a raster layer based on those those depths. I don't know how much depth variation, you may not have very much. So the farthest that uh, we go down in depth with uh, Sergo data is approximately 201 centimeters, which, you know, we're just kind of skimming the surface when it comes to pipelines for that. I understand. You, you know, if we zoom in a little bit closer, you can see some areas um, we're hitting some bedrock. Um, and the depth for that. Is uh, do, 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 130 centimeters for that polygon. So I'm not sure how much good that would do you. It would help be help, somewhat helpful. We can also do uh, depth to water table would be another one that you can map. And when you convert it, if you will decide to convert these to raster, um, you know some of our attributes in the in the database and in these maps, some of them are numeric and some of them are text. And in Spatial Analyst, I have the best luck using the uh, reclass, reclass lookup tool for the uh, text attributes and then just the standard reclass tool for uh, numeric data. Okay. Well, thank you. Uh, we did have, a, um, I think I'm saying this right, is uh, Raid, Reed uh, said, uh, made a statement that one problem that exists in the soil data is the discontinuity of polygons across county borders. Uh, was there an attempt to fix this issue? Is this question? Yeah, that, that's been an issue for a long time. Um, and sometimes it's not as bad as it looks, sometimes it is. Um, but we have made an effort every year to look at some of those um, areas along the county boundary. Um, let me zoom out just a little bit, where we have different values. And you can see one um, right here, where we've got a difference in depth of bedrock um, on this county boundary. And so sometimes, you know, unless you really look at the data close, sometimes maybe it's five centimeters difference, which doesn't amount to much. But sometimes, you know, we have some significant differences. And yeah, we do look at those every year and try to keep improving the quality of the data. Um, sometimes it's a matter of the age of the data. Those surveys may be really old and just haven't been updated recently. Um, sometimes we've just got a bust in our data. And uh, I guess, let me see if we have any more questions here. I think it's a great presentation and we appreciate you uh, taking the time today. So uh, um, I'm gonna go ahead and unmute uh, Ollie Powers and uh, Patrick Young of the ERISA chapter, Texas uh, members. So um, Ollie and Patrick, do you either, either of you have anything to add or, or any questions? I'm good on my end. Okay. Yep. Yep. Well, we well, sure we do sure appreciate, appreciate it, Steve. Um, let me go ahead and mute them again. So I don't. Uh... So anyway, we appreciate everybody uh, coming today. So um, if you do have questions, um, we'll feel free to uh, e email us at the uh, our. Um, what is it, uh, Ollie? Correct me if I'm wrong. It's info at erisatexas.org. Yeah, that's correct. We'll type it in here. Um, I'll do it right now. Also, send us uh, any type of uh, information, uh, first name and last name, and your email address, and any of your colleagues that are sitting with you that uh, we can uh, send you PDHs as well. If you have any questions, uh, we can pass them on to Steve. We'll be posting the recording here real soon. Um, we had a good attendance today. Uh, I think I saw, what, 62 at the max, and Ollie might uh, 
correct me on that one, but uh, um, somewhere in that ballpark. So I think it was a really good turnout. Um, I'm going to go ahead and uh, let Ollie uh, um, mention our workshops one more time, um, if you don't mind, Ollie. Sure. Um, so yours Texas is going to be running another couple of our asset management workshops workshops. Um, these are going to be taught by Alan Iba, CEO of Data Transfer Solutions. This year the workshops are going to be in two locations. Uh, first is going to be November 2nd in San Antonio at the Esri offices and the second one is going to be November 3rd in Austin at Fries and Nichols. These workshops are GIS oriented, however they are geared towards everyone in utilities, transportation, engineering, planning, environmental managers, and analysts um, in both public and private sectors. So for pricing and information you can please visit our events page at www.urissatexas.org. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, I've taken these, this workshop myself and I would highly recommend it for everyone. So and if you have any questions, again, um, visit our website or you can also email us. Perfect, perfect. And, and I posted the links into our chat window here. So uh, um, feel free, um, excellent all day workshop with uh, one of the leaders in, in the uh, industry with uh, asset management. Last thing I want to do is I want to go ahead and announce that uh, um, we have our next speaker series. And uh, um, let's see here. Um, we've got Leslie Zolman and uh, German Whitley, or is that, am I saying that correctly? And um, I believe, and so uh, we're going to be, uh, let's see here. Uh, Patrick, where are you? Might get you the help talk about this one. Really yeah, fast. can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Yeah, so Leslie Zolman and German Whitley are both um, volunteers with the GIS Core, which many of you I assume are probably familiar with because uh, they, they partner with ERISA International. And um, we've got them set up for our next presentation. Um, let's see here, which will be on Tuesday, October 17th. And uh, they'll be talking about one of the projects they've worked on um, with folks from across the world. Um, and they'll also be talking a little bit about the GIS core organization as a whole. Um, so if it's something that you might be interested in joining um, and looking for an opportunity to help out, um, definitely join that presentation to learn more. Perfect, thank you so much. Steve, we're getting some good uh, responses in the chat window. Uh, thank you and very informative. Thank you for sharing. And, and uh, um, one person even mentioned using the gridded soil data set for the potential wetland soil landscapes. This was a nice discussion, some of the other capabilities for the data set, so thank you. So we really do appreciate the, you taking the time today. So, and, um, and we will be posting this on our YouTube channel shortly after we do a little cleanup, uh, a recording of today's session, so you all can have it for the future. Um, and well, we'll be sending out the... Thank you <laughs> So and we'll be sending out the PDH certificates by the end of the week. So if you haven't received anything by Monday, please email us and let us know. Okay. Well, we're just a few minutes uh, before uh, noon here. Um, it looks like Megan had a comment here, Steve. Uh, database topology addressed, question mark. Is that... Uh... I am not in this data set. We do not try to build a feature data set or anything. Okay. So it's just like it comes out of the enterprise database. Okay. Well, they squeeze you know, one of the things, I guess that's, you know, probably for performance reasons, um, we're trying to build something that maps quickly and that just adds a little bit of overhead. Um, when we originally developed the data, the Sergo data, we do use, uh, File geo database with feature data sets and topology. Okay, great. Well, um, we appreciate it. We're going to go ahead and end it uh, about three minutes early. Uh, everybody, thank you for sticking around. Um, and uh, Steve, we, we sure do appreciate it. And uh, I'm sure we'll be in touch in the future with you. All right. We'll see you all next month. Thank you, everyone.